Daniel Tokar here at the Willow Forge in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Um, this is that sax blade that I forged out the other day. And this is the little Norse knife that I forged out of the same piece of pattern welded iron and a little bit of steel. And uh, all I've done at this point is uh, run a file along the, uh, the edge to straighten it a little bit. It has a tiny bit of curvature to it, which isn't quite right, but I think uh, filing out the center and the back uh, will correct that well enough. So I've got a nice little piece of T-stock in the vise, and I'm going to clamp it down and file the profile. Hey, what I've got here is a little scraper that I have made out of uh, regrinding an old file. And the first thing I'll do is use the scraper to take the uh, skin, the oxide layer off before I start filing. You might ask why I don't use a grinder for this. Part of my philosophy on doing old blades like this is that a lot of the shapes of blades were really set by the tools and techniques that people had available. So if you really want to reproduce a real blade, what you have to ask yourself is, did they have that tool when that blade was originally made? And they most definitely did not have high-speed grinders or uh, belt sanders back in the 8th century. So I'm not going to use one to make this blade. They most definitely had scrapers and files and rocks. So One way to think of one of these scrapers is to think of it as a single tooth file. It's something which you can use to remove a lot of the rough stuff that would tear a file to bits. The scale on the outside of the blade is a lot harder than the file. I don't know if you can see any of this, but most of the scale is gone from this side of the blade. Now I have a train coming. So now that the train is gone, I've continue scraping. I use the little end on my scraper to get into the low spots. Basically the few spots where there were hammer marks. I don't know if you can see what that looks like now. 
I think I'll move the camera so basically most of the scale has been removed from that side of the blade so it's safe to start using a file I have a big metal bastard file here Actually, what I should do is probably shim the tang up. The reason this is sticking up like this is that there's a taper on the tang. So I'm going to loosen up my clamp and reset this. There's a little shim under one side so that it's, it will actually be flat. This will probably work. Just a little piece of wood. Yep, much better. Still need to have the edge of that over. Second clamp just keeps it from rotating. Still up in the air a bit.
to even it out a little bit, you need to go from all directions. You can see all the filings I'm making. You can see progress very well. I'm going to move the camera again and you begin to see that we have a level and we just have some low spots which are still dark. So a little more filing to take those down. Some people ask me if they had files at the time, and I say files go all the way back 3,000 years, but whether they used them like this in the 8th century to make sacks, I really don't know. I think it's very possible but I don't know that there's any evidence that anybody's ever found that would prove it. Because you could do this same operation just by having a nice flat sandstone rock and sitting there and rubbing it back and forth for a couple of hours. Files work pretty fast, but rocks work pretty fast too. And this is just my take on it because I can maintain a flat and a particular geometry easier. It's more my training. And it is very possible that this was one of the methods. Because one of the other things you have to be careful of is assuming that there was only one method that was used in a particular time period to do something. It's very possible you had different shops, different crafts, lineages, that they were different families or groups of people that had their own methods for doing all of these operations and they did not necessarily share or compare notes with other people that were doing the same work. There was such a thing as a craft secret. So that's very possible that you had multiple traditions at work and I really dislike the idea that people have that an entire continent of craftsmen somehow got together at a big meeting somewhere and decided what was proper and what wasn't and that nobody ever did anything that wasn't proper. I tend to think that all sorts of things got tried or done depending upon the local conditions. And there's also the problem not the problem, but the fact that every craftsman tends to have his own advantages and disadvantages. If you're very good in the forge, you might be able to forge a blade out so close that you only have minimal correction to do, and you might use a different set of methods than if you're somebody who's not as good at shaping blades. So you might have to do a lot more finish work to shape them. And they may have 
better or worse methods for doing each of these operations. So as I say, there is a certain amount of latitude for personal preference and personal skill. Everybody has some things that they do better than other people. And you can't say that it's wrong or right if it works for that particular craftsman. Now, the other point I'm going to make is, is that because this is an early weapon that is what I say is a farmer's grade of sax, I am not going to go to a huge amount of trouble to put a high finish on it because I don't think the originals were highly finished. This is still a soft blade. It has not been heat treated. It's just as forged which is why it files so nicely. I'll show you that again. There are a few gray spots here and there, but that blade is now mostly level and has a good shape. So I think that's actually about as much trouble as they would have gone to before they heat treated it. Because they're going to have to clean it up again after you heat treat it. So it's much more as long as you've gotten the divots and irregularities out and uh, have a reasonable surface finish, there's no reason to uh, go all the way down to a polish and then put it in the fire and heat treat it. As long as it's smooth and straight, I think that's about where they would have stopped caring. This is not a king's weapon. This is a farmer's sack. It definitely is a level of economy at work here. Our friend the farmer does not have infinite resources. So, I'm going to stop the, uh, the video now. And, uh, well, actually what I'll do is I'll take this off and you can see the pile of... Uh, filings that I've got, because it's maybe not easy to see just how much I've taken off. So, I lift this up, and you see all of this powder here. This is what I have draw filed off the blade. That much has come off. And if you were a good 8th century smith, you would probably recycle that amount of metal. You'd save it up, feed it to your ducks, and turn it into another blade once you had enough of it. I'll pour it out onto the piece of paper here. That's maybe an ounce or so of uh, iron filings. Okay, I'm going to... Okay, back again. I've turned it around to the other side. Clamp it down. We do the same thing again. We take our scraper and we pull and knock scale off. Because the scale is tough on files.
Okay. I will use an old beat up course file to get that first layer down too because there is still enough oxide in there. that it will tear up a good file. Definitely a pronounced grain in the iron. The iron I use for the skin on this sack is welded up out of seven different pieces, different sizes and shapes and origins, and they're all basically iron, but even iron isn't just iron. There's always other things in there, varying amounts of slag. Some of it has a little phosphorus in it. Some of it has other things in it. There's even a tiny little variation in uh, carbon. Even though there's not much carbon in there to begin with, by the way this was welded and processed, some of the skin basically got case hardened in the fire. The outside parts of some of it absorbed more carbon than others, and after it got re-welded a couple of times, those skins get distributed, and they actually stay as 
carbon line so that when you file through you'll see some layers are a little different than others and it's basically the varying amounts of carbon it got from the fire because they all started out with basically uh, zero carbon or next to zero carbon and it was just exposure to the fire and how often it got welded that makes that variance. I don't know if you can see what that's looking like. Let me look at the camera here. I'll move this around so you can see the file has leveled it out. Those low spots are hammer marks and once I've got everything pretty much leveled and the geometry pretty much taken care of it'll actually be time to heat treat this thing because being a soft skin the skin will not really harden significantly so I should still be able to file the uh, outside of this blade after I'm done heat treating it because it won't really be very hard it will be pretty much a soft piece of iron with some variation in uh, carbon in the skin but not enough carbon in there to really make it hard the one little tiny piece of steel which was put in the center of that one bar is at this point a layer oh maybe a millimeter thick right in the center of the blade so it does not amount to much of anything at all except that it's in the right place that when this thing is sharp it will be right where the blade is right where the edge is so you'll have in effect an iron blade with some variation some patterning in it with a tiny piece of steel right where it needs to be on the edge and this is very much like what the originals were like they weren't really hard hard per se it's also why in some of the sagas and eddas you hear about people having to stop in the middle of a fight to step on their blade and straighten it back out because it's gotten bent from being used and that's very much what this blade will be like the reason it's nice and thick on the back and has a heavy taper is is they compensated for the softness of the iron by making a fairly thick back but to get a geometry that would work they had to have a fairly fast taper uh, all the way from the back to the edge there's no flat uh, back on this thing it's it's all a straight wedge from the back of the blade to the edge and that's just so you can have a thick blade like that in a reasonable width and still have a reasonable geometry for the edge otherwise it would cut like a hatchet of course this kind of a blade i think had uh, a good point for poking and you could probably slash fairly well with it maybe chop it would be a decent tool for doing farm work think of it like a corn knife or a machete and I really do think because we're talking about a uh, a modest farmer here we're not talking about somebody who had a lot of money a lot of resources he would have had a blade like this he would have had a spear and a knife and a shield and probably had an axe on the farm that he might or might not have been able to take to the war with him so the great majority of these guys did not have swords but I think almost anybody who had a farm probably had a sax somewhere on the farm as a tool anyway just like he probably had an axe somewhere on the farm as a tool um, dedicated fighting axes i think were a little higher class weapon but the woodworking the farming and felling axes 
were uh, scary enough as weapons can start draw for that. I can actually see quite a pronounced pattern in this thing. So you flatten it in one direction and then you flatten it in the next axis at 90 degrees and this is how you get a nice even geometry. If you only go from one direction you do not have a true wedge. You need to have that wedge run point to hilt and edge to back so you have to change directions every now and then to get the flat to orientate it and you also have to go head to tail so to speak because if you only work in one direction your arms have a preference you don't have a perfect range of motion so you then do tend to put in arcs and curvature and the only way you can prevent this from building up over time is to change the direction that you file from every now and then. Somebody's just driven up. I've got a guest. Okay, that was Mike visiting. So I will continue draw filing. I'll change the camera angle so you can get an idea of what this looks like from one end or the other. And it's actually pulling up nice little curls. I make filings. This removes a surprising amount of material very fast. And as I mentioned before, I think this is much closer to a finishing technique that they may have used. Because again, short of having a time machine, I doubt we'll ever actually know for absolutely sure how these blades were finished. And as far as I know, nobody's ever 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 found a sax with anything remotely like an original finish on it you can find things that are remarkably well preserved from an archaeological standpoint but they are still nothing like the blade was in life i'm looking at these little spots a few spots here and there Definitely have to get more up toward the tip here. And as I mentioned, I also have to change direction every now and then to try and take the natural motion of my arm out. So I'm going to start from this end again. See if I can bring it around. Boy, talk about a smooth transition. All right. Of course, it's always nice to make sure you have good footing because even though this is not a sharp blade and it doesn't really have a point on it yet, it would not do you any good to slip and run into it. Also, something of an insight when the uh, story of Voland uh, filing a blade 
down into filings and then feeding it to his ducts why that sort of makes sense because they were filing things which is again one of the reasons why I prefer saying that uh, filing a blade was probably closer to how they were finished than any modern method. So again, I'm going to take all these filings off my stand here. Of course, a lot of them have also hit the floor and show you that's, that's probably about half of what was filed off on one side. So I'm sure you could feed that to some ducks. Okay, so that's the rough, the rough filed blade. It still has a few spots where you can see a few things. It's been thinned down, but it's not been thinned down too much. Still has a fairly heavy back. But again, uh, being an iron blade, it is something that I should be able to file after I heat treat it. Because the only part that will get hard will be a little bit right in the core of that edge. Piece probably no more than a millimeter thick. And right now, I would say the the edge side of this blade uh, varies from just about nothing to maybe two millimeters thick, which is not bad for something that's going to go in the heat treating and then be um, filed on further. So I think I'm going to set up and uh, get ready to quench this thing. Okay. I've got a tub full of about eight or ten gallons of water. It's uh, body temperature water. I've warmed it up in a little bit. I've got the blade in the fire just starting. Now working it back and forth in the fire to get a long, even heat. It is edge upwards, the back. down in the fire, you always want the heaviest part, the back of the blade, down in the fire. You don't want the edge to get hot before the, uh, the back because prolonged heating gives you a bad grain structure. You want the edge to come up to temperature last and you want to do it slowly enough so that you don't have a huge temperature range across the blade. You want the whole blade to be about the same temperature, no matter how thick it is or how thin it is. Same thing with the tip to the tank. You want the whole thing to be about the same temperature. So I don't keep the tangs up. The tang in this case is pure iron. There's no steel in the tang anyway, so it wouldn't do anything to quench it. There's no reason to get it hot, no reason to quench it. We've got a pretty hot fire going here. Now, I don't have the uh, gray filter on, so this blade is going to look a lot hotter in the video than it does in real life. You want it to be a nice, full red, but not much above, say, 1400 degrees or so. And of course, that's part of the problem with my camera. I'm still not getting true color. More of a contrast problem. But I'm working on that. So as long as you know that the color you see in this video is not the color that I'm seeing. As a general rule, from what I've seen on the videos I've made before, this is going to look about five or 600 degrees hotter than it actually is. It's only going to be about 1400 degrees no matter how great it looks in the video. 
So don't go quenching any white hot metal. did not quench that back corner and I'm letting the heat run up and I'll take my little stone it stayed nice and straight it did get a little bit of curvature to it from the quench but that can be corrected a little bit by filing. And I will have to let down the uh, the temper further along the blade. All right. Here I'm taking a little bit of sandpaper to it just to get it shiny enough to draw temper. There's a little seam in the iron. It's just a little surface blemish. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is heat up a block of steel and uh, draw the temper. Okay. I've got a big block of steel in the fire that I've been heating up that will let me temper this blade. 
It's an inch and a half square, about four or five inch long. It's getting pretty close to a nice red. It'll have enough heat in it, I think, to do most of what I want. Put that on the brick. And I take the, the blade and make contact with it. Watching the colors run. Yeah, I've got the tip, a nice light purple, which is good for a tip that's thin on a heavy blade like this. And I'm trying to get the back to a blue and let the colors run up to a dark straw to sort of a dark, almost a bronzy color along the edge. Because this is a big beefy blade. And the natural tendency is to sort of chop with it. So you want to have a little bit of toughness in it. Not a pocket knife. it to make sure there's good contact because it's only transferring the heat from contact What I've got right now is a band of blue that's about oh a quarter of an inch wide along the back of the front half and going to that dark bronzy color up by the edge. Just about what we need. Of course, as the block cools down, it takes longer contact to get enough heat up. But that block is still a dull red to me. On the video, it's probably a lot brighter. there for a moment. If I was bright, I would have two blocks like that ready, so I could trade off as one cools off. Of course, nobody's ever accused me of being that smart. Of course, some of the residual heat is also working its way along the blade as well as the heat coming up from the block. So as the heat up here is coming toward here, and you have to be careful that you get the whole thing, that you don't have any hard spots, any place where you haven't drawn 
the temper along there. Still going along just fine here. I've sometimes thought that the reason why a lot of the uh, blades were not quenched and tempered is, is that unless you know about using a block like this to transfer heat to draw the temper, uh, as quenched, uh, there's a danger of it being brittle. And the one thing they would not want is a brittle blade. What I think I'm going to do is heat the block up again and start from the tang end and work forward because the, uh, the blade from about here forward has got a very nice rainbow on it. And back here we're just beginning to get the right colors. And I don't think there's enough heat left in that block to really do it. I've always heard that the best way is to take the longest amount of time you can to get a, a temper to draw, because the, the duration helps. It's not just the temperature, it's how long you've held it at that temperature. It's actually rather nice. When you hear about people drawing the temper three or four times, that's as much insurance to make sure that you don't have any spots that weren't properly heat treated, but it's also to get the duration of uh, I've always been fond of saying that if you do it slowly enough, you can get by with drawing the temper once. But it's really hard to do that properly. It's like having a really big block of steel at close to the temperature that you want to draw it at. If you had a really big block that was at, say, 800 degrees, um, it would take a long time to transfer its heat to the blade and you could keep that blade at just the right temperature for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And that would be ideal. That would be almost like being um, in a, uh, a heat treating oven but with the advantage of having a differential heat. Um, but that's very hard to manage. Yes, like I said, from about there forward, it's just about right. Here is okay, but it's still a little cold down here. So I think I'll start, I'll do the same thing. I'll get the block hot, but I'll start from the tang side and work forward because there is a little bit of heat in the blade now. It's not cold and wet like it was. And 
the next phase will be filing and finishing. And again, I believe these things had a file finish and uh, a fairly fast go over with a stone and then some sort of organic acid to bring out the, uh, the patterning and the pattern welding. Uh, it was probably something like sal ammoniac and vinegar, uh, something like that. I sometimes thought that just boiling salt water would probably be okay if you could do it long enough. That might even have some minor advantage in terms of, uh, well, nowhere near a high enough temperature to really make much of a difference with the hardness. But anyway, it'll take a few minutes. hot steel. I'm going to put it starting in the back. Again, it's a fairly beefy blade, so it takes a long time to transfer enough heat. Got just a little strip of blue on the back and a light gold along the rest. And you surely don't want the tang end to be brittle. If anything, you would like it to be purpley almost all the way to the edge. Again, it's not a pocket knife. Little bits of scale popping off my heating block. The other thing that will happen overnight on one of these iron blades is, is it'll actually move around a little bit in shape. That depending on uh, the stresses that have been locked in, uh, it'll warp itself or straighten itself a little bit. 
which is one of the more difficult things to plan for. That part needs to have just a little bit more. It's not quite like watching paint dry, but it's important to let it go at its own pace. If you try and hurry this too much, you're likely to let it down too far and have to do all that heat treating all over again. So better to do it slowly and carefully. I look at the other side of the blade every now and then too because there is no guarantee that you're actually getting exactly the same heat transfer along the body of the blade. So sometimes you can actually have one side that's just a little bit more drawn than the other. And that's more just the time it takes to conduct the heat. You'd think that they'd all come up at the same time, but occasionally they don't. Almost there. What I am happy about is, is that the blade is still straight on that axis. It has worked a little bit, put a little bit of arch into its back, but that's something again that can be corrected by a little bit of filing. can show this to you. It's hard to see the colors there, but we've got a big band of blue and a dark bronze along the edge. And that's about right for a big blade like this. You don't want it to be too hard, so I've let the whole tang area go almost to, to a full blue across the bottom there. But you can see how it's still bronzy along the edge.